Come on, let's sing that one more time. We are here for you. Come and do what you do. Set our hearts on you. Come and do what you do. Cause we need a move. Oh, we need a move. Come on, praise and praise. Come on, church. Yeah, we worship you, God. Oh, come on, don't let your praise stop. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you, God. You're in this place. Come on. Invite him into this place. Set the atmosphere for God to move this morning. Jesus, Jesus, come and have your way. church, my God. You are the center of this church. And we don't move unless you do, my God. We give you all the glory and we give you all the honor, God, because you deserve it all. We worship you. We worship you. Come on. We worship you, Jesus. We give you all the praise. We give you all the glory because it's all yours. Everything is yours, my God. Jesus, oh, we worship you, God. Walking around these walls, I thought by now they'd fall. But you have never failed me Waiting for chains to fall Knowing the battles won For you have never failed me yet Jesus Your promise still stands Great is your faith
Oh, yeah. 
symphony of praise. Come on, church, King of Glory. One more time, one more time, come on. Amen. Father, we love you. We bless you this morning for the honor you give us to come here, Lord, as we celebrate you and who you are and what you have for us. Father, I ask you to speak to us, Lord. I pray you challenge us by your word. I pray, God, Lord, for every single person in this room, God. May your spirit move in such a way, my God, that preaching becomes easy. And Father, I pray that the ears of those that are here, God, may be in tune, God, with what you would want us to say. My God, I decrease so that you may increase. And if there's someone here, Lord, today that needs to make the decision, my God, to make you their Lord and their Savior, God, would you do that today? We love you. We thank you in your name. We pray. And everybody says, amen. amen. We are on week two of revival. And uh, God has been doing some wonderful things. And I want to draw your attention today um, to the second book of Kings, 2 Kings chapter 5, 2 Kings chapter 5, 2 Kings chapter 5, in the Old Testament, pray for your pastor, Pastor Ariel, he is ministering at New Birth Port Ritchie uh, right now, so uh, we declare God's blessings over him, so we love Pastor Ariel, Nancy and the girls, and to all of you watching online, amen, we have an audience online, we want to say welcome to New Birth Point, Siena. Welcome home. Amen. God bless you as well. Second Kings chapter 5. We're going to read uh, the first verse and then we're going to jump to verse 9 through and including 14. The Bible says, in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, it says, Now Naaman, 
was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Verse 9. So Naaman went with his horses and his chariots and stopped at the door of Elijah's house. Elijah sent a messenger to say to him, go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all of the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in rage. But Naaman's servant went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. I want you to look at your neighbor and tell him, take a dip. Come on, you online, tell him. You online, take a dip. The Lord is calling us today to take a dip. God is inviting us this morning for us to dip into the Jordan River. Now, in order to understand why God assigned this man to go to this place, we have to know the series of events that happened throughout the course of the Bible at Jordan River. It was at Jordan River that Elijah the prophet God gave him the power to split the Jordan River in two. It is in that same river when Elijah goes up in a chariot of fire and Elijah stays alone. He hits the Jordan River again and it splits open again for a second time. But also in, jo in Joshua chapter number three, when Joshua is at the brink of crossing over and conquering the land of Jericho, once again the Jordan River is open and Joshua and the people of Israel cross on dry land. Several thousand years later, it is in that same Jordan River where John the Baptist for six months is preaching a message of repentance. And people will leave the city and go to the wilderness to be baptized at the Jordan River by John the Baptist. It is also at Jordan River, where Jesus himself, in Matthew chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, Jesus himself was baptized at the Jordan River. The Bible says, Matthew 3, 16, 17, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, and at that moment, heaven was opened. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him, and a voice from heaven said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. So the Jordan River represents a place of provision. The Jordan River represents a place of transition. The Jordan River represents a place where you enter a certain way and you come out another way. It is a way, it is a place where heavens open. It is the place where God speaks. It is a place where the Holy Spirit is manifested. And so today, as we're embarking in week two of revival, let me submit to you that God wants us to take a dip in this river because there's power he has for us. There's a word he has for us. And there's a seal he has for us. But before we can get the blessings of the Jordan, we have to go through the process of the Jordan. Let me talk about Naaman's physical condition. The physical condition of Naaman. The Bible says that Naaman, and it gives us a great pedigree. Naaman was the commander of the army. 
He was a great man. He was a servant to his master. He was highly regarded. The Lord, not the devil, the Lord had given him victory. The man was a brave warrior. Did you hear what I tell you? Did you hear those descriptive words? Did you hear this guy's resume? Commander. Great. Highly regarded. Victorious. Valiant. Courageous. Here is a man that had power, that had position, that had prestige. Here's a man that was successful. Here's a man that was a winner. Wherever he would fight, he would win. He was wealthy because he had slaves. He had the slave girl. He was a hero. He was respected by his colleagues, his peers, and his king. He was admired by everyone. He was even envied by others. But in the middle of all of that pedigree, in the middle of all of that resume, the verse ends up saying, but he was a leper. A three-letter conjunction word changed the perspective of who he was. Which, by the way, the name Naaman means pleasantness. Everywhere Naaman would go, it would, he would bring a pleasant spirit. Everywhere Naaman would go, he was public, he would produce public presentness. But aside from the public presentness, he had private struggles. Have you ever been around people like that? That in public, they act like they got it going on. That in public, they act like everything's okay. That in public, they give you the smile from ear to ear and they fake it till they make it. But deep down inside, when they get in the car and they drive away, tears start coming out of their eyes because they have their good and expressing public pleasantness. But in the hearts, in their private hearts, they have an inner struggle that no one knows but God. A champion. A warrior. A valiant man. Courageous, envied, a conqueror, but he had a problem. Notice that the Bible says in 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 1, at the end it says, but he had leprosy. Let me tell you this. He could think about all of his accomplishments. He could have enjoyed about his power. He could have enjoyed his prestige. He could have enjoyed his position. He could have admired his own wealth. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, when it was all said and done, when he would take off his robe, when he would take off his helmet, when he would take off his armor, when he would take off his spear, and he would take off his clothes and stand before a mirror, there was something that was in his life that he couldn't disguise. Listen to me, church. This guy was a leper, which, by the way, Today, if leprosy today is an equivalent to AIDS. Lepers were isolated and humiliated. As a matter of fact, they were outcast. This is the great contradiction. How can someone so influential, how can someone so, so, so affluent, someone so important have a disease of this nature? Because they were considered to be outcasts. They were considered to be untouchable. As a matter of fact, they were forced to wear torn clothing and shout wherever they would go, unclean, unclean, unclean. Because everybody needed to know beforehand of this man's condition. Which tells me that Naaman had just been contaminated by this disease. He wasn't a severe leper. He was at the initial stage of leprosy. So he would hide it with his garments. He would hide it with his apparel. He would hide it and hide it and hide it. But it was coming to a point that he couldn't hide it anymore. How many times some of us, we hide our failures and our sins and our shortcomings. We hide it by all the things that we have. We hide it by our car. We hide it by our luxury. We hide it by our jewelry. We hide it by the clothes we wear. We hide it by the side of the track we live in. We hide it by the jobs we have. But there's going to come a point that you can't camouflage that no more. There's going to come a point that that thing that's inside of you is going to overcome the things that's outside of you. And you got to come to a point in your life when you can say, I am willing to take the dip so that the thing that is killing me on the inside will no longer have a hold on me so that I can live life to the fullest of God's purpose for my life, church. 
Leprosy, my friend, was the most feared disease of the day. Because it was extremely contagious. It was an incurable disease. And for the most part, leprosy always led to death. Listen to me, church. Naaman was at the initial stage of his leprosy. He had concealed it, but now his clothing was not enough to cover his disease. But the challenge is, he can't talk to nobody about it because if he tells anybody he has leprosy, everybody's going to pull away from him. So he has to fake it. He has to pretend. He has to hide behind the glamour and the conquer and the wars and the victories and the shield and the sword and the chariots and the horses. But there's an inner problem. Listen, there's a generation desperately seeking for someone to touch the lepers of this generation. There's a sick generation right now that they're desperately seeking for someone to touch them. While people treated this man respectfully, no one would touch him. They would look at him. Wow, he's a great captain. Wow, he's a great warrior. Wow, he is amazing. Wow, look at his outfit. But nobody took the risk of putting their hands on this man. It's like, it's like when you know somebody that's cool, but they got a dirty past. And you, you don't get close enough, not even take a picture on social media, because you don't want to get seen with that person. He was famous. Everybody wanted to have what he had in terms of position, but nobody wanted to be who he was. And so he lacked physical touch. And the lack of touch hurt Naaman deeply. Like Naaman, too long. Many of us are yearning a touch from people around us. Did you know that one of the greatest gifts we have is to touch people? The power of a touch. When a husband is away and his wife and child longs to see their embrace. And all of a sudden, when, while they're talking on FaceTime or they're talking on Zoom. Oh my God, I can't wait to see you. I can't wait to touch you. And he might be out of town and out of state. But in, in, in this conversation, there's this thing. I wish I was close to hug you. There's something about a touch. Why is it that we sympathetically pat the shoulder when someone loses a game? If your kid is playing a basketball game or sports and they lose, what's the first thing we do? It's okay, son. Because there's something about the touch that makes them feel encouraged. Why do we bear a hug to a long friend that we haven't seen in a long time? Because the hug says more than I miss you. The hug is expressing love. Why is it that we hold babies? Why? Why is it that when a baby sees his mom, the first thing he does is reach out his hands and touch mom and dad? Why is it that we do that? Because touch brings comfort. Touch conveys acceptance. Touch promotes health. Touch imparts wholeness. And this man has no one to touch and no one wants to touch him. Can you imagine stumbling through life without being touched? Can you imagine that? Naaman did not have to imagine because that was his everyday reality. Leprosy was his ugly birthmark. It's like that person who has his birthmark in her face or in his face and they always put hair to cover it. They don't want nobody to see that they have a birthmark on their face. And they're always covering it and covering it and covering it. And, and well, girl, put your hair back. No, I don't want to put my hair back. This is the new style. It ain't a new style. You're just hiding that birthmark. Naaman had a birthmark, so to speak, that he couldn't hide. So I ask you today, as we watch that buffer video, what is your leprosy? What is it that you need to put under the water? What is it? What's the problem that you are trying to conceal? What hurt are you trying to cover up? You know, sometimes church people, we're the most hypocritical people in the world. We feel like we have to fake it. We feel like we have to impress. Listen, everybody that's in this room is in this room because we all got problems. Because we all, listen, the reason why I'm here is because I needed a Savior. Why? Because I was lost. The reason why I'm here is because I needed a Savior. Why? Because I was a sinner. And if I was a sinner and you're a sinner, we both have the same common denominator problem. 
Many times we come to fake the funk. But let me tell you, there's no need to cover it up. What prevents you from getting close to other people? Where do you need to be touched today is what the Lord is asking you. Where do you need God to touch you? Because we too, like Naaman, we've become proficient in covering our problems. We've become experts in pretending. If Hollywood needed actors, oh, they could find a whole bunch of them in the church. But we need a touch from God. You need a touch from God. So let me talk to you right now about Naaman's prescriptive cure. Because for every problem, the Bible gives us a cure. So what do we do? Where do we get help? Where do we go for healing? Sometimes we think that to get the blessings and the healing and the victory, we got to go up. We got to go up. But in this story, Naaman's prescriptive cure was not in going up. He already was up. He was a captain. He was a soldier. He was in, a friend of the, of, of the king. He was already up. And this process, his prescriptive cure was going down. He had to go down. And I'm here to tell you, church, before you go up, you got to be willing to go down, church. While down is contrary to the direction many people want to go, down is the way we must go if we want to find healing in our hearts and in our lives. Down is the route we must take if we're going to get a touch from God. And so he has a problem. And all of a sudden, a little girl who happens to be his slave begins to tell him, about a man who had the capacity to do a miracle in his life. Listen to me, church. We all in this room, and those of you watching online, we all need people in our lives who look past our arrogance to see our hurt in order to give us a way out of our mess. Listen to me, church. Naaman's wife's servant had been taken hostage from her family, from her homeland, to serve this master. And by default, she should have been afraid of Naaman. But she was not afraid and intimidated by Naaman's power, by Naaman's position, or Naaman's prestige. No, 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 no. She saw his pain. And although she was a slave, she called it by name. And she said, your problem is this. And in order to get your deliverance, this is the prescription to your deliverance. Listen to me, church. We need humble people in our lives who look past our titles and our roles and our positions, who look past our ranks, our bank accounts, our cars and our houses and see our loneliness and in our need and in our time of hurt. We need people who will touch us at the point of our need. We need people who will call our problems just the way they see them. That's the problem with many of us. We want to be around people that tell us everything's going to be all right. We want to be around people telling us, don't worry, God, God is with you. Listen, if you're living in sin and you're living a life of debauchery, yeah, God is with you. But you ain't going to get no victory. We need somebody to tell us the truth about where we are at so that we can walk away from the place we're in. We need people in our lives that will love us enough to bring correction in our walk. We need people in our lives that will give us tough love and will avoid us from making stupid mistakes in life we all need a prescription for our lives that will lead us towards a healing touch now Elijah gives the prescription to Naaman which was a bizarre prescription by the way 2nd Kings chapter 5 verse 10 it says go wash Seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and clean. Come on now, are you serious? In geography, the Jordan River, which by the way, Jordan means the descender, to descend. The Jordan River flows through a rift valley. So literally to go to Jordan was to go down, to go down. As a matter of fact, Jordan is connected to the Dead Sea. And the Dead Sea is the lowest part of the world on the earth. 
So God is telling Naaman, Papa, if you want your deliverance, you got to be willing to descend, get off your high horse, get off your prestigious position, get off of all you have, and go as low as you can go. Listen, this is crazy. This is crazy. Naaman was like, are you crazy? Not only you want me to go to the lowest part of the earth, but then you want me to dip seven times in a dirty lake? Are you crazy? And then he says, but don't we have beautiful rivers in Aram that are better than the Jordan? Listen to me. Naaman, which by the way, his name means pleasantness. When God commanded him to do something, he shifted his name. Because Naaman, if you put a between N-A-A, M-A-N, what he's saying is, nah, man, I ain't doing it. Nah, man. God is like, Papa, your deliverance is in being humble. Nah, man. Uh-uh. Your deliverance is going to the Jordan River. Nah, nah, not for me. Do you know who I am? Do you know what I got? Do you know who I am? Do you know how powerful I am? And, and, and sometimes God is challenging us to do some certain things so that we can be delivered from the leprosy of sin and the leprosy of disobedience. And we tell God, nah, man, nah, nah. Not me. Uh -uh, uh -uh. I I'm, I'm better than that. I'm bigger than that. But the key to your victory is aligned with your humility. And if you humble yourself before the Lord in due season, he will exalt you, church. And God is telling him, this is your way out. Nah, man. How many times God has tried to warn us and we're like, nah, man. Not me. Nah, man. It's not for me. I ain't going to stoop that low to save my marriage. Nah, let her stoop her down to my level. Stoop up to my level. Do you, why, why? Do you want me to tell him sorry? Nah, I ain't going to do that. That you want me to be committed to the church? Nah, man, I ain't going to do that. That you want me to pray? Nah, that's not for me. That you want me to see God's face? Nah, 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 nah. Yeah, somebody else, listen, I'm here to tell you. I'm here to tell you. The person that is limiting your victory is not your neighbor, is not your mama, is not your enemies, and is not your foe. The person that is paralyzing your potential is your capacity to say no when God is telling you to be low and humble yourself, church. Naaman doubted God's prescription. He undermined God's prescription. Naaman did not realize that the power was not in the water. The power was manifested in obeying what God said to do. Listen to me. Healing will always come when you do what God says to do. Healing will always come when you start obeying God. But Naaman continued to doubt. As he entered Jordan River, he's like, oh, nah, man, I ain't doing this, man. Listen, I went to Israel last year. And let me submit to you, the Jordan River is one of the dirtiest rivers I've ever been to in my life. You got ducks, you got birds, you got all kinds of stuff in there. Disgust. I'm talking about is it's a filth. As a matter of fact, it stinks. You can't see through. It's so green and full of a bunch of junk. You can't see. But sometimes God wants to take us to a place. Huh. Where all that we have and all that we bring to the plate can be swallowed in the mess of transformation that God has for us. God reminded him. And he said, Papa, I want you to go to the Jordan. And I want you to dip seven times. How many of us go to the Jordan? I'm like, God, I'm here. I made it. I'm here. Here's my, where's my miracle? But, but that was, that's partial obedience. God, I came to church. All right. Where's my miracle? God, I came to church. You're going to save my marriage. God, I came to church. I want my bank account to have six digits. No, no, wait, 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 wait. No, that's partial obedience is coming to the river. The other part of the obedience is submerging in the river. How many of us go to church and we're not committed to church? How many of us go to the house of the Lord and we don't have a relationship with the Lord of the house? This is what God told us yesterday. At our service, at our revival service in Kissimmee, the Lord told us he wants to take us back to the place where we can live in the fear of the Lord. He wants to take us back to a place where we can understand that as long as we're living a life that honors God, church. 
not enough to be at the Jordan. You got to take a dip. And he's like, well, I made it. No, Papa, Papa, you got to get in. Nah, man, that's not for me. Listen to me, church. The dipping will remove the symptoms of leprosy. And God is asking us today, this very moment, those of you that are here and you that are watching me online, God is asking us today to take a dip. Not one time, seven times. I could, I could, you know, I, 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 I could focus on what the seven represents, dispensationally, because every dip, for me, implies seven dispensations. You have in the Bible the dispensation of innocence. That was before Adam and Eve sinned. The dispensation of consciousness, when they noticed they were naked. The dispensation of human government, when God gave them the Ten Commandments. The dispensation of the Abrahamic promise, Genesis chapter 12. The dispensation of the law, Leviticus. The dispensation of grace, which is where we're at today. And the dispensation of the millennial reign of Christ, which will happen after the, when Jesus come again. So every dip could represent a dispensation. Every dip could represent God showing healing and grace in every dispensation. But let me take a little bit more personal. Because the writer of Proverbs tells us seven things. That God is trying to clean in our hearts. Look what he says in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16 through 19. Look what the Bible says. It says, there are six things that the Lord hates. Seven that are detestable to him. Now, I'm not saying Naaman had these seven things. I'm saying some of us may be dealing with these seven things. Look what he says. Haughty eyes. What does that mean? Arrogance. A lying tongue. Two. Hands that shed innocent blood. Three. Here's four. A heart that devises wicked schemes. Five. Feet that are quick to rush into evil. A false witness who pours out lies. And a person who stirs up conflict in the community. So I don't know which of these dips you need to take. I don't know where you are in your journey. Are you at the place where you're too arrogant for God to use you? Are you at the place that all that comes out of your, your mouth is a constant lie? That what you live on Sunday is contrary to who you are Monday through Friday? Are you angry and jealous of your brother? These are the things that the Lord is telling us. I need you to dip in the river seven times so all of these things come out of your life. Listen to me, church. God is challenging us today to take the dip. Why? Because the dip exhibits humility. And humility leads to obedience. And obedience will give you your miracle, church. And God asked for seven times. <laughs> Don't try to do six and get away with it. It's seven. It's seven. It's seven. Get in the water. I don't know about you, but every time I'm going to go in the pool, I mean, now now everybody got heated pools, but, but every time you go in the pool, just take your big fat toe and you're like, and usually what I do, this is, you know, what I do is right before I'm going to go in the pool, I start doing push-ups. I can get hot, right? Try to, you know, because, and every time, I feel I'm ready. Put my foot in the water, my toe in the water. And all of a sudden, I feel goosebumps come up in my body. And, and so I'm like, okay, so how am I going to do this? Am I going to jump? Am I going to do it gradually? And one thing I hate is that when I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to jump in, my wife or one of my kids splash water on me. Ooh. But there comes a moment, in, and there comes a moment in me making that decision that I got to make a choice. And every nine out of ten times, I never go step at a time. Nine out of ten times, I'm, like, I'm just going to have to jump in. Because if, 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 if I try to do it gradually, I'm never going to do it. I'm here to tell you, and I, so there are some people in this room, that every time you, God is calling you to go in deeper, you're like, I don't know if I should do it. I don't know. And I'll do it next week. I promise next week. But God is telling you right now, stop trying to measure it and stop trying to gauge it. And stop trying to make, make it make sense in your heart. What God is telling you right now is just 
just plunging, jumping, diving, get in, because I promise you, it might get chill for a second or two, but once you're under the water, you're going to experience the refreshing of the water. I'm here to tell you, God is calling you to dive into the presence of his spirit so that your eyes may be open to the power of God. Listen to me, church. Naaman, not only did he obey, but I want to talk about the prostrating compliance. Naaman's prostrating compliance. Why must Naaman, you and I, descend downward in order to receive our healing? Why must we have a compliant attitude towards God's instructions, church? Look what Peter tells us. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5 and 6. And all of you clothe yourself with humility towards one another. Why? Because God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves. Therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you and I in due Before we get our healings, we got to scrape to the bottom. Before we get our victory, we got to descend to Jordan. We have to look at death before we can see life. We have to taste pain before we can experience joy, church. We have to humble ourselves to the lowly places and lowly people before we can feel the hand of God lifting us up again, church. Naaman was that low. Look what the Bible says in verse 14. So Naaman went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times. According to the command of the man of God. Then his skin was restored and became like the skin of a small boy. And he was clean. Listen to me church. If his skin, if his leprosy defined his earlier life, it was God's healing touch that redefined his latter life. Let God define who you are. Having experienced the grace of God was his change. Listen to me, church. Having experienced the grace of God was what brought about change in his life. Not only physically, but spiritually and vocationally. You'd be surprised how better your life would be if you submerge, submerge yourself in the river. Which the river of Jordan is symbolic to the Holy Spirit. Naaman stood before Elijah. And look what he says after he obeyed. In verse 15 he says, I know there is no God in the whole world except in Israel. Therefore, accept the, service, the offering of your service. So God is calling us this morning to take a dip. He went from being a heal, a sick man to being a heal man. He went from being a Sumerian. I'm sorry, an Aramian who God gave him victory over Samaria. He wasn't a Christian. I'm sorry, he wasn't a believer of God. He was a heathen. But this experience changed him from an unbeliever to a believer to the point that he says, now there is a God. I know there's a God in Israel. Obedience brings about salvation. A lost man to a saved man. A great man to a gracious man. And from a commander of men to a servant of all. Here was a man that had felt the touch of God and was changed now and forever. Naaman had a layer of inner pain trapped beneath his outward scars. He was desperate for a healing touch. And I'm going to ask you, church, are you desperate for a touch from the Lord? And if the answer is yes, are you willing to take the dip? Because when we get desperate, listen, we will go to whatever lengths necessary to experience a touch of God to, and feel His grace. Even when God says to humble ourselves by washing in the dirty so I want to challenge New Birth today. 
Revival. Revival means to come back alive. And like we saw in that video, he was submerged. But when he came back up, he was aware of his purpose. And I'm here to tell you, church, I'm here to tell you, friend, I'm here to tell you, you that are watching online, the Lord is challenging you and I to take a dip. Are you going to be naming pleasantness or are you going to be, nah, man, that's not for me. Are you going to live out your name or are you going to change who you are to justify your mess? Because the Lord is calling us this morning to obey. And that's revival. That's revival. That's revival is coming back alive. Revival is living life to the purpose that God has for you. Jesus said this, and this is life. And this is the everlasting life, Jesus said. That they may know you, God, Father. That's life. So what do you need to dip in your life today? What you need to submerge today in your life, is it your pride? Is it your ego? Is it your tongue? Is it your heart? Is it the way you think of others? Is it a haughty spirit? Because Proverbs says there's seven things that God, six things that detest the Lord and seven God can't stand. So the Lord is, he wants us to analyze where we are. And whatever that thing is, put it under the water. Put it under the water. Submerge it. And come out a new person. Submerge it. Listen to me. When the people of Israel, they were, they were in, listen to me. They were slaves for 450 years. The first step of deliverance, you know what it was? God made them cross over the Red Sea. God opened the waters. They went through. They walked in the sea, slaves, and they walked out the Red Sea free. They walked in the Red Sea fearful. And they finished on the other side with tambourines singing and praising praises to the Lord. You cannot sing praises if you're not willing to go through the waters. You cannot be free from the sin of your past if you're not willing to go through the waters. So the Lord is calling us today to take a dip, to plunge in, to jump in, to do or die, but do something. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray for those of you that are here and those of you that are watching me online. Because the Lord is challenging us today to plunge. Lord, but let me think about it, you know. No, no, jump in, Papa. Jump in, sweetheart. Jump in. So I'm going to pray. And I would like for every eye to be closed, please, and every head to be bowed. If you're here today and you heard the Lord's word and you're willing to take a plunge, your position is not in question here today. Your title, how much money you make, that's not in question. What's in question is, is the sickness, is the pain, and the hurt behind everything you have. That's what God is looking for. Our titles don't impress God. He's king of kings. He ain't no better title than that. He's lord of lords. Ain't no better title than that. God is not impressed, impressed by how many letters I got before, after my name. PhD, MD, XYZ. That don't impress God. God is not impressed by how many zeros I have in my bank account. What impresses God is my level of obedience and surrendering everything I have so that he can use me for his glory. So I want to pray. If you're here right now and you're willing to take a plunge, the first plunge you need to take if you don't have Jesus in your heart is to embrace him. To embrace him. Jesus himself dipped himself in the Jordan River and he was God. How much more you and I so I'm going to count to three. If you want Jesus and you want to take the plunge, I want you to raise your hand at the count of three. 
And if you're watching me online and you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, when I count to three, I want you to write there, I want Jesus. And somebody's going to follow up with you and somebody's going to connect with you. But whether you're watching online or you're here on site, if you want Jesus at the count of three, I don't want you to be the second one to raise your hand, the third one to raise your hand. I don't want you to look around who does it first. You need to obey for yourself and you're going to be the first one. No more nah, man, is I'm going to obey God to the fullness of his word all over this room. If you want Jesus at the count of three, lift your hands. One, two, three. Lift your hands in Jesus' name. If you want Jesus, lift your hand. I see one hand. I see two hands. If you're online and you want Jesus, come on, I want you to write it right now. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. This is the day of salvation. Receive him as your Lord and Savior. So here's what we're going to do. It is our custom at New Birth. When somebody accepts Jesus, we're all praying them in. So if you're online or those of you that are here on site, I want you to repeat this prayer with me, but I want the entire church to repeat this prayer with me so we can coach them into the presence of God. With your eyes closed, repeat after me out loud. Say, dear Jesus, I believe that you are God and you have a plan for my life. I give you my heart. I give you my life. I give you my soul. Wash me with your precious blood and dip me in the river of your Holy Spirit and with your help I promise to serve you for the rest of my life I thank you because I am saved in Jesus name amen amen come on put those hands together to God be the glory to God be the glory to God be the glory right now in the name of Jesus I don't know what sickness you have it could be a sickness in the body sickness in the heart sickness in the soul sickness of the mind but right now the healer is here the healer is here and I don't know about you but I believe he's a healer I believe there is nothing impossible with God I believe he's my healer I believe nothing is impossible with God I believe there is nothing impossible with God and if you believe with me right now I want you to get up on your feet. If you need a miracle right now, I know we can't touch you, but if you believe that God is a healer, I want you right now to get up on your feet. And we're going to pray for healing. We're going to pray for healing. Father, in the name of Jesus, I declare my God, your mighty hand over your church. My God, I pray right now for every disease. You said in Isaiah 53 and 5, that by your stripes we're healed. You said, my God, in your word, my God, is anyone sick among us? Call the elders of the church and anoint them with oil, because the prayer of the fervent will be able to do much. And right now, I declare healing.
Sing it, church. Sing it. Sing it. Sing it, church. Sometimes you just got to step back and look at what God is doing in your life and do one of these. And I can see the devil. Right? Cause you can't be blind to what he's doing. I can see the devil. You're right. <laughs> you do got a reason to praise. You do got a reason to go crazy. And I think what God's been doing these past two weeks has been phenomenal. Can I get an Amen. Can we just honor the head of the house, Pastor Gabby Mejia? Oh, come on. You can honor a little bit better than that. Come on, let honor just run out of you right now. Come on, thank you, God, for his life. Thank you, God, for his sacrifice. Come on, you can honor a little bit more for what God has done in your life because of him. God, thank you because the things he has to go through in private so we can experience your glory here, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Church, you may be seated. Oh, man, it's been an awesome Sunday, but I want to transition us into a moment of generosity. Somebody say generosity. We're going to honor God with our tithes and offerings so you can get that prepared. Uh, and then I'll give you a moment in just a couple of seconds to come on up here uh, and drop off your envelopes if you do. There are multiple ways to give, so you can go ahead and throw that graphic up. Just read through them if you'd like. we got a number. We've got Venmo. If you don't have either of those ways accessible to you, at the end of service, you can head outside to the lobby uh, and use your debit card to swipe at the square. Man, it's really interesting to me that in the story that we read this morning of Naaman, it's not that God created something new, but God sent him to something that already was. And I think specifically with your finances, right, because we want to get personal. Can, I, can somebody say personal? We want to get personal. I think with your finances, you were expecting for God to make a new river in order for us to give. We're expecting for God to make a new way in order for us to give. But God sent Naaman to something that already was. And I need you to understand 
that a faithful tithe is not when God gives you surplus or profit. A faithful tithe is when you grab from what you already have right here, right now. Maybe you don't have tomorrow, but guess what you do have? Today. So if you're faithful with today, you got a faithful tithe right there. Maybe you don't have the gifts that you want or the skills that you want, but what you do have now is what God is asking for. And so this morning, uh, don't wait for a sign. This is your sign to be faithful. I don't think we need to pray to be faithful. Can I get an amen on that? God, I, do I have to be faithful? It's, it's like an oxymoron to pray, God, do I have to be faithful? So this morning, whatever God's asking you in your heart, I would ask that you would be faithful to God and honor him with your tithes and offering. Every single Sunday, uh, we give individually in the buckets or whatever way that you give. But we like to give together by saying this declaration. If you guys can throw it up at the count of three, I would love for you to say this with me uh, so we can give together as a family. Amen. At the count of three, ready? One, two, three. We understand and agree that tithing is an act of obedience, an attitude of the heart, an expectation of the harvest of our Creator, and an opportunity. We covenant with God and each other to faithfully give 100% of our tithes. Come on, can we make some noise for generous giving this morning? It's good to be generous. It's why we love Christmas so much. Is anybody ready for Christmas? I, okay, cool. <laughs> I'm so ready for Christmas, and I'm never ready for Christmas. Uh, but I believe the people around me have influenced me uh, to be ready for Christmas. If you do have a cash offering, you can go ahead and step up, uh, sign a check to NB for new birth, and you can throw it up in the buckets. I'm going to move on to the moment of announcements. But if you do have your offering ready, uh, and it is cash or check, you can just throw it up here, uh, and we'll collect it after service. Um, this next announcement is the most important announcement for me as your pastor. Can we make some noise? Can we praise God for the salvation that happened this morning? Come on, people got saved. There's a party in heaven. We're turning up. I would be doing backflips if I knew how. There's salvation, and that's what revival is all about. Somebody say this with me. Revival starts with salvation. Come on, say it again. Revival starts with with salvation. Come on, and I'm glad to experience not just this idea of revival, but to know that we're in revival. And even though it starts with salvation, it's actually continued through discipleship. You start this journey by saying yes to Jesus, but you stay on the journey by looking more like Jesus every day that you wake up. And we've got ways for you to get connected to our church because we don't want you to just start looking at Jesus. We want you to start looking like Jesus. And so this morning, I want to give you this phone number. I would love for you to write it down. I believe it's on the screens. It's 407-476-6681. Again, it's 407-476-6681. If you want to get connected to our church, I would even say even if you don't want to get connected to our church, get connected to our church. This is the number for all the questions that you have. We've got things available all week long, like hope groups. Somebody say hope groups. Come on. If you are not a part of a hope group, can you listen to everybody right now who is a part of a hope group? Come on. If you're in a hope group, can you make some noise? Come on. Look at the joy in their hearts. Come on. They don't clap just to clap. Come on. Hope groups is so fun, so beautiful, and so loving. Uh, we just got done with the leadership hope group. Uh, specifically for youth and young adults. And we started our middle school and high school hope groups like two weeks ago. It's been rock socking and popping. Uh, don't know what that means, but it's been so fun uh, just to see people posting on their Instagram that they're in a hope group. So if you're in middle school, Ladies or males, we need you to sign up for a hope group. How do you do that? By contacting the number or by DMing us on our Instagram, newbirth.pointsiena. Uh, DM us, we'll send you the link and we'll get you connected to start this week. If you're in high school, there is a hope group for you. If you're a young adult, there are hope groups starting at the end of the month. And if you're an adult, there are hope groups happening for you on Zoom. We want to connect with you guys. We want you to know people at your church. You know what I'm saying? Like, you come here and you're like, oh my God, God is so good. And you're just like, who is that? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like you should know who you're crying next to. You should know who's ministered next to you. You should know their name. When God gives them a word, you should be crying with them because you know the situation they're in. Because you know them personally. When God calls somebody and says, hey, come on, this word is for you. When you're hearing a sermon, you should be like, oh my God, that, I'm going to start praying right now. Because I know who that's for. Because I'm walking with them. I'm by their side. And you can do that by connecting to a Hope Group Church. 
I'm really excited for this next one. Somebody say baptism. Hey, y'all, y'all saw your boy baptizing in the video? You saw me? You saw me? Come on. I just, all right, what's up? It wasn't an actual baptism. It was scripted. So, you know, it was kind of cool, but it was fun. Baptism is, I like to explain this. I like to explain this. And, uh, uh, should I say that? Yeah, yeah I, I like to explain it this way. Baptism is like the wedding ring for the matrimony. It's the evidence that you're broken. Now, if you're married, that makes a lot of sense. Or if you want to get married, that makes a lot of sense. Holla at your boy. Man, but right now, if you're single, you're probably saying like, okay, but like, why do I have to get baptized? And it's because Jesus died publicly on a cross for you. And so baptism is your way of saying God did something on the inside and I want to show it on the outside. I'm not going to be private about what I believe. I'm going to be public and stowed cone about what I believe. And here's the crazy thing. A lot of people have come to our church not because they got invited, but because they saw somebody else get baptized at our church. And I've heard people say, oh, my God, like, yo, if he got baptized at your church, I got to check out what the heck is going on. Because I would have never imagined him following Jesus. And baptism in itself is a way for you to evangelize to people by just telling them that you love Jesus. Because when you tell people what you love and what you're passionate about, somehow, for some reason, they automatically follow. Man, so if you've never been baptized and you want to make an outward confession of what happened inside of you with Jesus, uh, you want to sign up with the number is again it's 407 476 6681 somebody say baptism on september 27th we're gonna have a party we're gonna turn up we're gonna go crazy uh, and it's gonna be fun somebody say revival next week is our third week of revival don't worry i'm not gonna fall off the stage i just gotta get your attention it's the next week of revival i need you i need you i need you i need you somebody say need I need you to bring somebody. I need you to, come on, revival starts with salvation. And if we're not bringing lost people to our church, if we're not bringing people who don't know about Jesus to our church, if we're not bringing people who have different beliefs than us to our church, are we really the church of Jesus Christ? And so next week, I need you to make it your priority. Somebody say priority. Let's go. I like when y'all talk to me. It's nice. It's nice. I need you to make it your priority to bring somebody to church and to be the hands and feet of Jesus. So this week, you're going to pray on Monday. You're going to say, God, who at my job, who at my school, who at my whatever that may be, am I going to invite to church? And you're not going to text this person. You're either going to call this person or you're going to meet them face to face and be like, yo, my friend, my bro, my sister, whatever they are to you, I want you to come to church with me. It's going to be awesome. And if you don't like church, I know you like food, so I'll buy you lunch after, and we'll hang out after church, and food is on me. Don't worry about it. Like, whatever. Leave the kids with us. We'll leave them at the house after service. We'll go just double date. Just find an excuse to bring somebody to the presence of the Lord uh, next Sunday. And lastly, on when is this? Uh, The anniversary service? (laughs) In two weeks? I'm really bad with my dates. My birthday is next month. It's going to be so good. We're going to turn up. That's like the only date I know, October 22nd, if you want to bless your boy. Uh, with a hug, right? I'm not asking for stuff. Chill out. Oh, my God. That's your youth pastor? Yes. I just Come on. Um, October 3rd. There we go. That's when it is. October 3rd, we have our anniversary service. It's going to be at Calvary, Orlando. Come on. New birth turns five. Oh, my goodness. I don't know what you're supposed to learn at the age of five, uh, but I know five-year-olds do some pretty crazy stuff. So New Birth is going to do some crazy stuff because we turn in five years old. We're kind of getting out the terrible twos, threes area where we were just doing a lot of fun, crazy stuff. Uh, and we're going to get to some, I don't know, whatever you do at five years old. But it's going to be awesome. we got my boy Scott Wilson. Uh, he's going to be helping us out by giving the word that day. And it's going to be so beautiful. I would love to have you there. All our campuses are gathering at 7 p.m. here. We have enough space to fit everybody with social distancing. Uh, so don't worry about, um, you know, being at risk or anything like that. Just show up at 7 p.m. We'd love to have you turn up, go crazy, and be really excited. Church, stand up on your feet. We're going to dismiss. Anybody have a good Sunday this morning? I had a real good Sunday. Uh, and it was even better because you were with us. If you're a first-time guest, we love you so much. Can we make some noise for all our first-time guests? I love you. We love you so much.
you're a first time guest, please feel at home. Like on our side of the relationship, you're already a family member. And so we pray that on your side of the relationship, you would feel like this is a place you can call home, uh, that this is a place where you can find brothers and sisters of faith and really grow with people. And so I'm gonna pray for y'all church and then we're gonna dismiss by rows. Again, if you haven't given your tithes, you can step up after we pray. If not, you can do it at the square. And for any questions regarding new birth, 407-476-6681. Lord, we love you. We thank you so much, God, for an amazing Sunday. Come on, lift up your hands all over this church. Pray with me. God, we thank you for what you've done this morning. Thank you for the word that is planted in our hearts. We pray that it would blossom into a garden throughout the week, that we would water it, that we would secure it, and that we would live it out, God. We pray that every single day we wake up, we would ask you, God, what is it that you want of us today, and how can we look more like Jesus? We pray that people would get connected to a hope group, that people would get connected to discipleship, that they would get connected to get baptized, and more than anything, God, that they would be connected to the church that makes a difference in the world for them to know Jesus. We love you, and we say all this in your beautiful wonderful faithful name come on somebody say it real loud with me amen amen and amen church wait to be dismissed and the, the ushers will lead you out love you guys